Members of the jury, we have now reached that point in the trial where you are about to enter your final function as jurors, which, as you all appreciate, is one of the most important duties of citizenship in this country. You've all given very careful attention to the evidence, and I am confident you will act together with fairness and impartiality and reach a just verdict in this case. I'm now going to tell you about the principles of law governing this case. You are required to accept my instruction as the, to the law. You should consider these instructions as a whole, and do not pick out any particular instruction and place undue emphasis upon it. Any ideas you have of what the law is or what the law should be, or any statements by the attorneys as to what the law may be, must be disregarded by you if they are in conflict with my charge. I sit here as the judge of the law. As part of this responsibility, I have made various rulings and statements throughout this trial. Do not view these rulings and statements as clues about how I think this case should be decided. They are not. They are based solely on my understanding of the law and rules of evidence, and they do not reflect any opinions of mine about the merits of this case. Even if they did, you should disregard them, because it is your role to decide this case and not mine. <coughs> the lawyers are here as advocates for their clients. In their opening statements and in their summations, they have given you their views of the evidence and their arguments in favor of their clients' respective positions. While you may consider their comments, nothing that the attorneys say is evidence and their comments are not binding upon you. You sit here as the judges of the facts. You alone have the responsibility of deciding the factual issues in this case. It is your recollection and evaluation of the evidence that controls. If the attorneys or I say anything about the facts in this case that disagrees with your recollection of the evidence, it is your recollection that you should rely on. Your decision in this case must be based solely on the evidence presented and my instruction on the law. The evidence in this case consists of, one, the testimony you heard from the witnesses, two, the exhibits that have been marked into evidence which will be presented to you in the jury room, and three, the deposition testimony and answers to trial will be read into the record. Any testimony that I have stricken from the record is not evidence and should not be considered by you in your deliberations. This means that even though you may remember the testimony, you are not to use it in your discussions or deliberations. Further, if I gave a limiting instruction as to how to use certain evidence, that evidence must be considered by you for that purpose only. You cannot use it for any other purpose. The plaintiffs and defendants have each prepared a set of their respective admitted exhibits ordered numerically by exhibit number. Each set of exhibits has its own index which describes the exhibits and indicates which witness or witnesses the exhibit pertains to. Additionally, evidence was presented to you in the form of answers of one of the parties to written interrogatories submitted by the other side. These answers were given in writing and under oath before the trial in response to questions that were submitted under established court procedures. You should consider the answers insofar as possible in the same way as if they were made from the witness stand. Evidence was also presented in the form of photographs and videos. Some of the photographs were admitted into evidence and therefore will go back with you in the jury room to view during your deliberations. Some of the photographs and the videos were for demonstrative purposes only and were not admitted as evidence. In this case, the plaintiffs are Douglas and Rosalind Barden, David and Darlene Etheridge, DeAngelo McNeil, and William and Elizabeth Ronnie. The defendants are Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated. The plaintiffs contend that the product or products manufactured, sold, and or distributed by the defendants were not reasonably safe for their intended or foreseeable uses because they did not contain a warning about their hazards and that the products or products manufactured, sold, and or distributed by the defendants were also not reasonably safe for their intended or foreseeable uses because they were defectively designed or manufactured. The plaintiffs also contend that their exposures to the defendants' products were substantial factors in causing them to develop mesothelioma and that these defendants are responsible for the injuries suffered by them. The defendants contend that their talcum powder products were safe and did not contain <coughs> asbestos. The defendants further contend that the plaintiffs have failed to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that they used any of the defendants' talcum powder products that were contaminated with asbestos or that the use of any talcum powder product was a substantial cause of their illnesses. 
The court has consolidated these four lawsuits brought by different plaintiffs for efficiency and convenience only. Commonalities of each plaintiff's case should not be considered as evidence and should not be considered in determining whether any plaintiff has carried his or her burden of proof. There are four plaintiffs in this trial, and the claims of each of them must be considered separately. There are two defendants in this trial. That fact alone does not mean that if one is liable, both are liable, or if one is not liable, both are not liable. Each defendant is entitled to a fair consideration of its own defense and is not to be prejudiced by the fact, should it become a fact, that you find for a plaintiff and against the other defendant. Each of the plaintiffs must prove each element of his or her claims with regard to each defendant. You are to resolve the factual disputes in this case based upon the exhibits which you will have in the jury room with you and your recollection of the testimony of witnesses as bearing on those issues. You have been permitted to make notes during the course of this trial, but as I told you before we started, these notes are not evidence. You may use the notes during your deliberations to help you to recall what the testimony was. However, do not overemphasize the significance of a written note made by yourself or by a fellow juror. If a note does help to refresh your recollection, it has then been useful, but it is your recollection, not the note, which is important. If your memory differs, you have an absolute right to rely solely on your own recollection. I will now explain the burden of proof to you. The burden of proof is on each plaintiff to establish his or her claims by a preponderance or the greater weight of the evidence. In other words, if a person makes an allegation, then that person must prove the allegation. If a plaintiff fails to carry that burden, he or she is not entitled to a favorable decision on that claim. To sustain the burden, the evidence supporting the claim must weigh heavier and be more persuasive in your mind than the contrary evidence. It makes no difference if the heavier weight is small in amount. As long as the evidence supporting the claim weighs heavier in your mind, then the burden of proof has been satisfied and the party who has the burden is entitled to your favorable decision on that claim. However, if you find if if you find that the evidence is equal in weight or if the evidence weighs heavier in your mind against the party who has the burden, then the burden of proof has not been carried and the party with the burden is not entitled to your decision on that claim. When I talk about weighing the evidence, I refer to its capacity to persuade you. I do not mean that you are to count the number of witnesses presented by each side or measure the length of their testimony. The concept of weighing the evidence refers to its quality and not its quantity. In order to decide whether the burden of proof has been carried, you are to sift through the believable evidence and determine the persuasive weight which you feel should be assigned to it. Proof need not come wholly from the witnesses produced by the party having the burden of proof, but may be derived from any believable evidence in the case. Proof of possibility as distinguished from probability is not enough. In these actions, each of the plaintiffs has the burden of establishing by preponderance of the evidence all of the facts necessary to prove one or more of their claims. With respect to their failure to warn claim, the plaintiffs must prove that the defendants manufactured and or sold products that were not reasonably safe for their intended or foreseeable uses because they lacked adequate warnings or instructions when they left the defendant's control, that the plaintiffs used or was exposed to the products, that the lack of warning or instruction was a substantial factor in their exposure to asbestos, and that their use of and exposure to the defendant's products was a substantial factor in causing the plaintiff's mesotheliomas. With respect to the plaintiff's design defect claims, each of the plaintiffs must prove that the defendants manufactured and or sold products that were not reasonably safe for their intended or foreseeable use because they were defectively designed, that the defect in design existed before the products left the defendant's control, and that the design defect was a substantial factor in causing the plaintiff's mesotheliomas. With respect to the plaintiff's manufacturing defect claims, each of the plaintiffs must prove that the defendant's products contained a manufacturing defect which made the product not reasonably safe in that the condition of the product did not meet the defendant's specifications, and that the manufacturing defect was a substantial factor in causing the plaintiff's mesotheliomas. Evidence may be direct or circumstantial. 
Direct evidence is direct proof of a fact, such as a testimony of an eyewitness. Circumstantial evidence, sometimes called inferences, consists of a chain of circumstances pointing to the existence of certain facts. Circumstantial evidence is based upon deductions or logical conclusions that you reach from the direct evidence. Let me give you an example of direct and circumstantial evidence. <clears throat> if a witness testified that he or she observed snow falling last night, that would be an example of direct evidence. On the other hand, if a witness testified there was no snow on the ground before going to sleep, and that when he or she arose in the morning, the ground was snow covered, you could infer from these facts that it snowed during the night. That would be an example of circumstantial evidence. You may consider both direct and circumstantial evidence in deciding this case. The law permits you to give equal weight to both, but it is for you to decide how much weight to give to any evidence. When deciding this case, you are permitted to draw inferences from the evidence. Inferences are deductions or logical conclusions drawn from the evidence. Use logic, your collective common knowledge, and your common sense when determining what inferences can be made from the evidence. In deciding the facts of this case, you will have to decide which witnesses to believe and which witnesses not to believe. You may believe everything a witness says, or only part of it, or none of it. In deciding what to believe, here are some factors you may want to consider. One, does the witness have an interest in the outcome of this case? Two, how good and accurate is the witness's recollection? Three, what was the witness's ability to know what he or she was talking about? Four, were there any contradictions or changes in the witness's testimony? Did the witness say one thing at one time and something different at some other time? If so, you may consider whether or not the discrepancy involves a matter of importance or whether it results from an innocent mistake or willful lie. You may consider any explanation that the witnesses gave explaining the inconsistency. Five, you may consider the demeanor of the witness. By that, I mean the way the witness acted, the way the witness talked, or the way the witness reacted to certain questions. Six, use your common sense when evaluating the testimony of the witness. If the witness told you something that did not make sense, you have a right to reject that testimony. On the other hand, if what the witness said seemed reasonable and logical, you have a right to accept that testimony. Seven, is the witness's testimony reasonable when considered in light of other evidence that you believe? If you believe that any witness or party willfully or knowingly testified falsely to any facts significant in your, to your decision in this case with intent to deceive you, you may give such weight to his or her testimony as you may deem it is entitled. You may believe some of it, or you may, in your discretion, disregard all of it. You have heard testimony from witnesses who were called as experts. Generally, witnesses can testify only about the facts and are not permitted to give opinions. However, an exception to this rule exists in the case of an expert witness. An expert witness may give an opinion on matters in which the witness has some special knowledge, education, skill, experience, or training. An expert witness may be able to assist you in understanding the evidence in this case or in performing your duties as a fact finder. But I want to emphasize to you that the determination of the facts in this case rests solely with you as jurors. In this case, Dr. James Weber, Dr. William Longo, Dr. Stephen Compton, <coughs> Dr. Jacqueline Moline, Dr. Arnold Brody, and Dr. John Maddox were called as experts by the plaintiffs and testified about certain opinions. Dr. Gregory Diet and Dr. Richard Atanas were called as experts by the defendants and testified about certain opinions. In examining each expert's opinions, you may consider the person's reasons for testifying, if any. You may also consider the qualifications of the individual and the believability of the expert, including all the considerations that generally apply when you are deciding whether or not to believe a witness's testimony. The weight of the expert's opinion depends on the facts on which the expert bases his or her opinions. You as jurors must also decide whether the facts relied upon by the expert actually exist. Finally, you are not bound by the testimony of an expert. You may give it whatever weight you deem is appropriate. You may accept or reject all or part of an expert's opinions. An expert witness was asked to assume that certain facts were true and to give an opinion based on that assumption. That is called a hypothetical question. You must determine if any fact assumed by the witness has not been proved 
and the effects of that omission, if any, upon the weight of the expert's opinion. It is for you, the jury, to resolve any conflicts in the testimony of the experts using the same guidelines and determining credibility that I mentioned earlier. The amount of an expert witness's fee is a matter that you may consider as possibly affecting the believability of an expert. However, there is nothing improper in the expert witness being paid a reasonable fee for his or her work and for his or her time in attending court. You will recall that statements were read in connection with the direct or cross-examination of expert witnesses. These statements were contained in a reference or professional publication, journal, pamphlet, or periodical. However, merely because a publication has been read to you does not mean that you must accept it as binding on any of your decisions. You may give the statements discussed in the publication whatever weight you believe they deserve using your reason, judgment, and common sense. It is for you to determine the credibility of the author of the statements read to you. In this trial, I allowed you to submit certain questions that you wanted the witnesses to answer. Some were, in fact, asked and answered, and others were not asked. Keep in mind that the rules of evidence or other rules of court may have prevented me from allowing some questions. I have applied the same rules to your questions that I applied to the questions asked by the lawyers. Some questions may have been modified or rephrased. Some may have been asked just as you have written them, and others may not have been asked at all. If a question that you submitted was not asked, you should not take it personally, nor should you attach any significance to my decision not to allow the question. I caution you not to treat jurors' questions or the answers to those questions differently than you would treat any other testimony. You are to carefully consider all of the testimony and other evidence in this case before deciding how much weight to give particular testimony. The defendants, as manufacturers and sellers of a product, have the duty to make and sell a product that is reasonably safe. In this charge, when I refer to a reasonably safe product, I mean a product that is reasonably fit, suitable, and safe for its intended or reasonable foreseeable uses. The defendants owe that duty to direct users of the product, to reasonably foreseeable users of the product, and to those who may reasonably be expected to come into contact with it. <coughs> the defendants are liable only if plaintiffs prove that the product causing the harm was not reasonably safe for its intended purpose. In this case, the plaintiffs claim that the defendants' product or products were not reasonably safe for their intended purpose because of A, a failure to adequately warn or instruct, B, a design defect, or C, a manufacturing defect. Before you may consider whether the plaintiffs have proven the elements of a failure to warn claim, a design defect claim, or a manufacturing defect claim, you must first determine whether the plaintiffs were exposed to asbestos in their products sold by the defendants. You must determine whether each plaintiff was exposed to asbestos from Johnson's baby powder and or shower to shower. If the answer to that question is no, then cease your deliberations as to all the defendants and inform the court officer by submitting a note to the judge. If your answer is yes, then continue your deliberations and follow the remaining instructions on the verdict sheet. Let me now discuss the law governing the plaintiff's claim of failure to warn. If a product fails to contain an adequate warning or instruction, it is defective. The plaintiffs say the product or products did not contain an adequate warning or instruction. The defendants say the product or products did not require a warning. The defendants, as the manufacturers or sellers of the product, had a duty to provide adequate warnings or instructions about the dangers the product may present. The defendants have this duty, even if the product was perfectly designed and manufactured. To decide the plaintiff's failure to warn claim, you must determine what warnings and instructions the defendants provided and whether those warnings and instructions were adequate. Let's now talk about what a warning or instruction is. Warnings or instructions may consist of statements that a product should not be used at all under certain circumstances, that it should be used only in a particular way, or that it should be used with particular care. Warnings or instructions may be in the form of words, symbols, or pictures. They must be in a form which will effectively convey the information essential to make the use of the product reasonably safe. To be adequate, the warning or instruction must be the kind of warning or instruction which a reasonably prudent manufacturer or seller in the same or similar circumstances would have provided to people intended to use the product. 
adequate information may be required to be given to others in the chain of distribution of the product, such as from the manufacturer and seller to the buyer, or from the manufacturer and the seller directly to the user. An adequate warning or instruction will communicate sufficient information on the dangers of the product and how to use the product safely. When deciding whether the information provided is adequate, you should take into account the characteristics of the people recently expected to use the product and ordinary common knowledge. To the extent you find the danger existed in the products at the time they were sold or distributed, you must assume the defendants knew of the dangers of the product at the time the product was sold or distributed. With that assumption, you must then decide whether the defendants acted in a reasonably in a reasonable, prudent manner in marketing the product without any adequate warning or instruction. To establish a claim of failure to warn, the plaintiffs must prove all of the following elements by a preponderance greater weight of the payable evidence. One, that the product needed a warning or instruction in order to be reasonably fit, suitable, and safe for its intended or reasonably foreseeable use. Two, that the product failed to contain an adequate warning or instruction. Three, that the failure to adequately warn or instruct existed before the product left the control of the defendants. Four, that the plaintiff was a direct or reasonably foreseeable user or a person who might be reasonably expected to come into contact with the product. Five, that the plaintiff would have followed an adequate warning or instruction if it had been provided, but you need not concern yourself with this in this case. Six, that the failure to adequately warn or instruct was a proximate cause of the plaintiff's injuries. Proximate cause means that the failure to warn or instruct was a substantial factor which simply or in combination with another cause or causes brought about the injury. Plaintiffs need not prove that their injury could have been anticipated so long as it was foreseeable that some harm could result from the failure to warn or instruct. If an adequate warning or instruction would have reduced the risk of the occurrence of the injury, you may find that its absence was a contributing factor to the happening of the injury. If, on the other hand, the failure to warn or instruct does not add to the risk of the occurrence of the injury and therefore is not a contributing factor to the happening of the injury, then the plaintiffs have failed to establish that the failure to warn or instruct was a proximate cause of the injury. The defendants have no burden to prove that any other potential cause was a substantial factor in causing the plaintiff's mesothelioma. It is not the defendant's burden to prove what caused the plaintiff's illness. That burden always remains with the plaintiff. If the plaintiffs have proven each element by a preponderance of the credible evidence, then you must find for the plaintiffs. If, on the other hand, the plaintiffs have failed to prove any of the elements, then you must find for the defendants. The plaintiffs claim that the product was designed in a defective manner. To establish this claim, the plaintiffs must prove the following elements by the preponderance of the greater weight of the credible evidence that A, the product was designed in a defective manner, B, the defect existed before the product left the control of the defendants, C, the defect was a proximate cause of the injury. I will now instruct, I uh, will now discuss these elements with you. A, that the product was designed in a defective manner. A design defect is established by proof that the risks or dangers of the product as designed outweighs its usefulness, and therefore that a reasonably careful manufacturer or supplier would not have sold the product at all in the form in which it was sold. A product may not be considered reasonably safe unless the risks have been reduced to the greatest extent possible, consistent with the product's continued utility. In deciding whether the dangers of the product outweigh its usefulness, and therefore that a reasonably careful manufacturer, seller, or distributor would not have manufactured, sold, or distributed the product at all in the form in which it was manufactured, sold, or distributed, you must determine whether the defendants, who are supposed to know the harms of the products would cause, acted in a reasonably careful manner in manufacturing or selling the product. To reach this conclusion, you must consider and weigh the following factors. One, the usefulness and benefit of the product as it was designed to the user and the public as a whole. Was there a need that this product be designed in this specific way? 
two, the safety aspects of the product, that is, the likelihood or risk that the product as designed would cause the injury and the probable seriousness of any injury which could have or should have been anticipated through the use of the product. Three, was the substitute design for this product feasible and practical? Was there available a substitute product at the time of manufacture, sale, or distribution which would meet the same needs or perform the same functions as this product without containing the alleged defect? In other words, the existence of a more safely designed product diminishes the justification for using a challenged design in either the manufacture, sale, or distribution of a particular product. Four, the ability of the defendants to eliminate the unsafe character of the product without impairing its usefulness or making it too expensive to maintain its utility. Five, the ability of foreseeable users to avoid danger by the exercise of care in the use of the product. And six, the foreseeable users' awareness of the dangers inherent in the product and their availability because of general public knowledge of the obvious condition of the product or of the existence of suitable warnings or instructions. In applying the risk utility factors, remember that a product may not be considered reasonably safe unless the risks have been reduced to the greatest extent possible consistent with the product's continued utility, that is, without impairing its usefulness and without making it too expensive for it to be reasonably marketable. In proving a defect in the design of a product, the plaintiffs need not prove that the defendants knew that the injuries alleged in this case would happen as it did. Knowledge of the dangers of the product is legally placed upon the defendants. The question for you to decide is whether, assuming the defendants knew of the dangers of the products, it was nevertheless reasonably careful in the manner in which it designed, marketed, or sold the products. If the risks or dangers of the product outweigh its usefulness, and therefore a reasonably careful manufacturer, seller, or supplier would not have sold the product at all in the form in which it was sold, then the product was designed in an effective manner. But on the other hand, if the plaintiffs failed to prove this, then the product was not designed in an effective manner. The control of the defendants and C, the defect was a proximate cause of the injury. Proximate cause means that the design defect was a substantial factor which singly or in combination with another cause or causes brought about the injury. The plaintiffs need not prove that this same injury could have been anticipated so long as it was reasonably foreseeable that some significant harm could result from the design defect. If the defect does not add to the risk of the occurrence of the injury and therefore is not a contributing factor to the happening of the injury, then the plaintiff has failed to establish that the design defect was a proximate cause of the injury. If the plaintiffs have proven each element, then you must find for the plaintiffs. If, on the other hand, the plaintiffs have failed to prove any of the elements, then you must find for the defendants. The plaintiffs claim that the product was manufactured in a defective manner. To establish this claim, the plaintiffs must prove all of the following elements by a preponderance greater weight of the credible evidence. One, the products contained a manufacturing defect which made the product not reasonably safe. To determine if the product had a manufacturing defect, you must decide what the condition of the product as claimed should have been according to the defendant's design specifications and what its condition was as it was made. If you find there is no difference between the two conditions, there was no manufacturing defect. If there was a difference, you must decide if that difference made the product not reasonably safe for its intended or foreseeable uses. Let me repeat that because I missed the word. If there was a difference, you must decide if that difference made the product not reasonably safe for its intended or reasonably foreseeable uses. If the answer is yes, then you have found the product to be defective. The plaintiff need not prove the defendants knew of the defect or that the defendants caused the defect to occur. Whether there was a manufacturing defect in the product may be shown to you by the plaintiffs in one of two ways. First of all, it may be demonstrated by direct evidence, such as a defective part. Second, you may infer that there was a defect by reasoning from the circumstances and facts shown. The plaintiffs say the product was defective because it contained asbestos. 
and thereby failed to meet the defendant's own specifications to be asbestos free. The defendants say the product was not defective because it did not contain asbestos. This element may be established by proof that the product deviated from the maker's own design specifications. Two, that the defect existed before the product left the control of the defendant. Three, that the plaintiffs were direct or reasonable foreseeable users or persons who might reasonably be expected to come into contact with the product or products. Four, that the manufacturing defect was a proximate cause of the plaintiff's injuries. The last requirement for holding the defendant liable is that the defective the defect must have been a proximate cause of the injury. Proximate cause means that the manufacturing defect in the product was a substantial factor which simply or in combination with another cause or causes brought about the injury. The plaintiffs need not prove that this same injury which occurred could have been anticipated so long as it was reasonably, so long as it was foreseeable that some significant harm could result from the manufacturing defect. If the manufacturing defect does not add to the risk of the occurrence of a particular injury, and hence was not a contributing factor in the happening of the injury, then the plaintiffs have failed to establish that the manufacturing defect was the proximate cause of the injury. Remember, by proximate cause, it is meant that the manufacturing defect was a substantial factor, which singly or in combination with another cause brought about the injury. Substantial means that the product was an efficient cause of the plaintiff's injury. Liability should not be imposed on mere guesswork. By proximate cause, we mean that the product was an efficient cause of the plaintiff's injury and not trivial or inconsequential. It is not necessary for an exposure to be the sole or even the dominant cause of the plaintiff's injury in order to be considered a proximate cause. There can be many proximate causes of an injury or disease, and there can be many substantial contributing factors to an injury. In that regard, substantial means that it is not an imaginary or fanciful factor having no connection whatsoever or only an insignificant connection with the harm. The word substantial refers not to quantity but to quality. The fact that there may have been other independent or contributing causes does not relieve a defendant from liability. There may be more than one substantial factor in bringing about the harm suffered by the plaintiff. If we find that a plaintiff's use of or exposure to a product manufactured, sold, and or distributed by the defendant was not a substantial contributing factor in causing their mesothelioma, then you should find for the defendants. If, after considering all the evidence, you conclude that a plaintiff's use or exposure to the defendant's product was a substantial contributing factor in causing their mesothelioma, you must conclude that the plaintiff established proximate cause as to the defendant, even if you also believe that some other exposure that they had was also a substantial contributing factor in bringing about their disease. I shall now instruct you on the law governing damages in the event you decide the liability issue in favor of the plaintiffs. If you find more than one defendant liable to any of the plaintiffs, you will be required to apportion among the liable defendants their respective contributions to the cause of that plaintiff's mesothelioma. The percentages must add up to 100%. The burden of proof on the issue of apportionment is upon the defendants. In considering whether faults may be apportioned among the defendants, you may consider whatever factors based upon the evidence that you determine to be relevant. The fact that I instruct you on damages should not be considered as suggesting any view of mine about which party is entitled to prevail in this case. Instructions of damages are given for your guidance in the event that you find any of the plaintiffs are entitled to a verdict. I am required to provide instructions on damages in all cases where the trial includes a claim for damages. The plaintiffs have the burden of establishing by the ponderance of the evidence each item of damages that they claim. The plaintiffs must also prove that the damages were the natural and probable consequences of the defendant's actions. The actions must have been a proximate cause of the damages. Damages may not be based on conjecture or speculation. If you find for any of the plaintiffs, they are entitled to recover fair and reasonable money damages for the full extent of the harm caused, no more and no less. Plaintiff David Etheridge is seeking damages for his lost earnings. For Plaintiff Deborah David Etheridge, his past and future lost earnings have been stipulated to. The reasonable range of those earnings had he not become ill. 
is $1,328,127 to $1,434,358. Plaintiffs D'Angelo McNeil, William Browning, and Douglas Barton have not claimed lost wage income <coughs> as part of their damages claim. Because no claim or evidence of lost wage income has been submitted for plaintiffs D'Angelo McNeil, William Browning, and Douglas Barton, you should not consider lost wage income for these plaintiffs as part of any damage calculation. In all of the cases, the plaintiffs are seeking damages for their pain and suffering, disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life, and their spouse's loss of consortium. I will now discuss these categories of damages with you. If you find for the plaintiff he or she is entitled to recover fair and reasonable compensation for the full extent of the harm and losses caused, no more and no less. Fair and reasonable compensation means to make the plaintiff's whole for any permanent or temporary injury and the consequences of that injury or injuries approximately caused by the defendant's products. Disability or impairment means worsening, weakening, or loss of faculties, health, or ability to participate in activities, including the inability to pursue one's normal pleasure and enjoyment. You must determine how the injury deprived the plaintiff of his or her customary activities as a whole person. <coughs> this measure of damages is what a reasonable person would consider to be adequate and just under all of the circumstances of the case to compensate the plaintiff for his or her injury and his or her consequent disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life. The law also recognizes as proper items for recovery the pain, physical and mental suffering, discomfort, and distress that a person may endure as a natural consequence of the injury. The measure of damages is what a reasonable person would consider to be adequate and just under all of the circumstances to compensate a plaintiff. Here are some factors you may want to take into account when fixing the amount of the award for disability, impairment, loss of enjoyment of life, pain, and suffering. You may consider the person's age, usual activities, occupation, family responsibilities, and similar relevant facts in evaluating the probable consequences of any injury you find they have suffered. You are to consider the nature, character, and seriousness of any injury, discomfort, or disfigurement. You may also consider their duration, as any award you make must cover the damages suffered by the plaintiffs from the onset of their disease to the time that he or she dies. The law does not provide you with any table, schedule, or formula by which a person's pain and suffering, disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life may be measured in terms of money. That amount is left to your sound discretion. You are to use your sound discretion to attempt to make the plaintiffs whole as far as money can do so based upon reason and sound judgment without any passion, prejudice, bias, or sympathy. You each know from your common experience the nature of pain and suffering, disability, impairment, and loss of enjoyment of life. And you also know the nature and function of money. The task of equating the two so as to arrive at a fair and reasonable award of damages requires a high order of human judgment. For this reason, the law can provide no better yardstick for your guidance than your own impartial judgment and experience. You are to exercise sound judgment as to what is fair, just, and reasonable under all the circumstances. You should, of course, consider the testimony of the plaintiffs on the subject of their discomforts. You should also scrutinize all the other evidence presented by the parties on this subject, including, of course, testimony of medical doctors who appear. After considering the evidence, you shall award some money that will fairly and reasonably compensate the plaintiff for his or her pain and suffering, disability, impairment, loss of enjoyment of life, approximately caused by the defendant's products. Elizabeth Ronnie, Roslyn Barden, and Darlene Etheridge have asserted loss of consortium claims. A spouse is entitled to the services of his or her spouse in attending to the household duties companionship and comfort, and consortium, that is, marital relations. A plaintiff who is awarded a verdict is entitled to fair and reasonable compensation for any loss of impairment of his or her spouse's services, society, or consortium because of the injury sustained by him or her as a proximate result of the defendant's products. 
damages may be awarded not only for the total loss of services, but for a worsening of their quality. The period of this loss is calculated from the onset of plaintiff's symptoms from mesothelioma until death. Your oath as jurors requires you to decide this case fairly and impartially without sympathy, passion, bias, or prejudice. You are to decide this case based solely upon the evidence that you find believable and in accordance with the rule of law that I give you. Sympathy is an emotion which is normal for human beings. No one can be critical of you for feeling some degree of sympathy in this man. However, that sympathy must play no part in your thinking and in the decision you reach in the jury room. Defendants of corporations. Under the law, a corporation is entitled to be treated the same as anyone else and is entitled to be treated the same as a private individual. Similarly, your decision must not be based upon bias or prejudice which you might have developed during the trial for or against any party. Your duty is to judge this case impartially, and a decision based on sympathy, passion, bias, or prejudice would violate that duty. You are not advocates for either party. You are the judges of the facts. Remember the instructions that I gave you at the opening of this case that you must not conduct any investigation or research of any nature whatsoever relating to this case. You must not use the internet or any other resource for any purpose at all relating to this case. You must not even look up the meaning of a word in the dictionary. You are to consider only the evidence presented to you in this courtroom and the instructions as to the law that I give you. As I indicated in my preliminary instruction to you, if I determine that any of you has violated this rule, it may result in a mistrial or in a penalty being imposed on the person who violated the rule or fails to advise the court if another member of the jury has violated this rule. Your sole interest as jurors is to determine the truth from the evidence that has been presented to you here in this courtroom in this case. It is your duty as jurors to consult with one another and to deliberate with a view to reaching an agreement do so without compromising your individual judgment. Each of you must decide the case for yourself, but do so only after an impartial consideration of the evidence with the other jurors. Since this is a civil case, any verdict of 5 to 1 or 6 to 0 is a legal verdict. Therefore, it is not necessary that all six jurors agree on each question. An agreement of any five jurors is sufficient. All six jurors must deliberate fully and fairly on each and every question, and all six jurors must determine and vote upon each question. It is not necessary that the same five jurors agree upon the answers to all questions. Whenever at least five jurors have agreed to an answer, that question has been decided, and you may move on to consider the remaining questions in the case if it is appropriate to do so. All six jurors must participate fully in deliberating on the remaining questions. A juror who has been outvoted on any question shall continue to deliberate with the other jurors fairly, impartially, honestly, and conscientiously to decide the remaining questions. Each juror must consider each question with an open mind. When at least five of you have agreed upon a verdict, knock on the jury room door, indicate to the attendant you've reached a verdict, and say nothing more. The attendant will escort you back to the jury box so that the court may receive your verdict. I have prepared jury verdicts each, jury verdict sheets, excuse me, for each of the four plaintiffs, which I believe should make your task simpler. I will be sending one copy of each of those verdict sheets with you to the jury room. The sheets have questions that you must consider and answer within the framework of the instructions that I have given you. I'll now review those questions with you. So I'm going to ask Officer Martin, um, pass out, there are four separate ones, pass one each out to <coughs> I just want to include all four of them. The text of each of these is the same, but each plaintiff has their own version. So this is for this is new. <coughs>
we now have one for each respective panel. I'm only going to review one because they are all the same, but you must take each one separately into consideration. I'm going to review uh, the verdict sheet that's been prepared for uh, David and Dorvina Fritch, as an example. Note, at least five jurors must agree on the answer to each question. The same five jurors do not have to agree on each answer. Your votes for each question must be five to one or six to zero. Please answer each question separately and be sure to follow the instruction below each question. Questions must be answered in the order they are presented. Question one. Have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge was exposed to asbestos from any of the following defendants' top products? Defendants Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Inc. are listed separately. Each one has a yes or a no, and then there's a vote um, for each one. The vote must be five to one or six to zero. For any defendant or defendants to which you have answered yes, proceed to question two. If you answered no as to all defendants, do not proceed further. Tell the court A that you have reached a verdict. If you answered no as to one defendant, do not proceed further as to that defendant. Do proceed to question two for the defendant as to which you have answered yes. Question two, so this deals with failure to warn. Have the plaintiffs, David and Darlene Etheridge, proven by preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' towel products were not reasonably fit, suitable, and safe for their intended or reasonably foreseeable uses because they lacked an adequate warning or instruction? There's a notation there for Johnson & Johnson, and one for Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated. Indicates yes or no, and then the vote. The vote must be five to one or six to zero. Remember, this is for any defendant for whom you answer uh, question one, yes. For any defendant as to which you answer yes, proceed to question three. For any defendant or defendants to which you answer no, proceed to question number four. Question three, have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendant health products that lacked an adequate warning or instruction was a substantial factor in causing his mesothelioma? Again, the defendants are separately indicated, yes or no, and then a vote which must be five to one or six to zero. Proceed to question number four. Question number four is with regard to the design defect claim. Question four, have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' talc products were defectively designed because the risk or danger of the product as designed outweighed its usefulness and therefore a reasonably careful manufacturer or supplier would not have sold the product in the form in which it was sold. There's an indication there for Johnson & Johnson and one for Johnson & Johnson <coughs> Consumer Incorporated, yes or no, and then a vote, five to one or six to zero. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answered yes, proceed to question five. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answered no, proceed to question six. Question number five. Have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendants' top products that were defectively designed was a substantial factor in causing his mesothelioma? The indication of Johnson Johnson, Johnson Johnson Consumer Incorporated, yes, no, and then a vote, five to one, six to zero. Proceed to question six. Question six is with regard to the manufacturing defect claim. Question six. Have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by preponderance of the evidence that any of the following defendants' top products were defectively dis manufactured because their composition deviated from the defendant's design, specification, or standards? Johnson Johnson, Johnson Johnson Consumer Inc. Yes, no, vote five to one, six to zero. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answer yes, proceed to question seven. For any defendant or defendants as to which you answered question, you answered no to question six, but yes to question three or five, proceed to question eight. Question seven. 
have plaintiffs David and Darlene Etheridge proven by a preponderance of the evidence that David Etheridge's exposure to asbestos from any of the following defendants' top products that were defectively manufactured was a substantial factor in causing his mesothelioma. Johnson Johnson, Johnson Johnson Consumer Inc. are separately set out, yes or no, and the vote 5 to 1 or 6 to 0. If you answered yes, as to either defendant on question numbers three, five, or seven, proceed to question eight. If you answered no to questions three, five, and seven, for all defendants, do not proceed far further and tell the court if you have reached a verdict. Next section is damage. Question number eight. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate David Etheridge for his lab loss earnings? But there's the amount and a vote. Remember, five to one, six to zero. Now, going through Mr. Um, Etheridge's uh, burden sheet, remember that if, uh, with regard to the other plaintiffs, none of the other plaintiffs have a loss earnings claim. So you're not going to see that question if you get to it as to the any of the other plaintiffs. Proceed to question nine. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate David Etheridge for his past disability impairment, lost enjoyment of life, and pain and suffering? There's a line there for an amount, and then a vote, five to one, six to zero. Proceed to question 10. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate David Etheridge for his future disability impairment, lost enjoyment of life, and pain and suffering? And there's a line there for an amount and the vote five to one, six to zero. Question eleven. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate Darlene Etheridge for her past loss of David Etheridge's spousal service society consortium? There's a line there for the amount and the vote. Proceed to question twelve. What sum of money will fairly and reasonably compensate Darlene Etheridge for her future loss of David Etheridge's Spousal Services Society and Consortium. There's an amount there and then the vote. Uh, remember that three of the plaintiffs have a spousal uh, consortium claim. Ms. McNeil does not. Proceed to question number 13. Question 13. If you answer yes as to both Johnson & Johnson and Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated in any of the questions three, five, or seven, Set forth the percentage that you find describes or measures their contribution to the cause of David Etheridge's mesothelioma. The percentages must add up to 100%. So you have Johnson & Johnson there, um, and there's a line for the percentage, and then Johnson & Johnson Consumer Incorporated, and there's a line for the percentage. I think what's missing here is the vote, which must be five to one, six to zero, so we will make sure that you have a verdict sheet that actually as a spot for you to vote. And then please tell the court if you've reached a verdict. There is a, a line there for the jury four person to, uh, to sign off and then the date. So could you collect all of the verdict sheet now? Please hand them all back in. We will have one verdict sheet for each respective plaintiff in the jury room. And the questions on each of these sheets will be your verdict for that case. The four person for this jury is juror number one. Four person ensures that each juror deliberates, writes any questions the jury may have for the court, and marks the verdict and vote on the jury question sheet. When a jury returns to the courtroom, the four person must report the verdict to the court by giving the vote and answer each of the questions on the jury verdict sheet as they are read by the court. After you have begun deliberations, all communications are done by sending a note from your foreperson. Knock on the door, hand the note to the attendant. No member of the jury should communicate with anyone outside the jury room except in this fashion. No member of the jury should indicate at any time how the jury stands numerically or otherwise until after you reach the verdict. <coughs> when I receive your note that you have reached the verdict, the attorneys will be gathered and I will have the entire jury into the court to receive the verdict. Should you desire to communicate for any other reason, you must send a note in the same fashion. 
after I have read your note, I will discuss it with the council and then reply to you in open court on the record. I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your service on this journey. We realize things has interfered with your daily lives, caused you inconvenience, and caused you uh, more inconvenience when I've asked you to stay additional days and after hours. And I do appreciate it, and the parties and the attorneys do as well. You know, I said in the beginning, our judicial system is a function without people like you. And I would tell jurors when I agree um, in the jury assembly room, and I swear in jurors, that literally every courthouse in the United States would have to close if it weren't for people like you that came to jury duty, not knowing what would happen, but uh, ultimately took an oath to serve as jurors and to fill that duty, the greatest duty, frankly, on and off of citizenship and thank you. Now, as I, um, before we hit alternates, which I must, I must first confer with counsel, one more time, uh, counsel. Just remember to submit notes. 
You can now take the notebooks with you, and um, our alternates are just waiting here momentarily.